When Bill and I were discussing what haunt to cover for this week's throwback kill, we decided that we hadn't covered anything from the early season. And so when I started thinking about it, one haunt really stuck out to me. And that was a haunt from Louis Klaus back in the 2016 season. That would have been the first year that I was filming for Millis Whitetail. And he shot a giant buck right away in October. And uh, naturally that haunt definitely made me think about my experience this past fall with the big 10 pointer on public land that max and i were on a couple of different times and even though that hunt did not exactly end the way that we wanted it to it was pretty disappointing not to get a shot it was still a really good example of how you can take advantage of a buck's early season feeding patterns and specifically a mature buck's early season feeding patterns and you couple that with the cold front you know, that deer, nine times out of 10, probably wouldn't have stepped out in daylight, but with those conditions, he did. And I kind of just wanted to dive into why we were there in the first place. And a couple of things that I think I could have done differently that in retrospect, I think it might've ended in a different outcome with that buck. So first, while we were there, uh, that's probably the most important thing. Um, if you go all the way back to 2018, when I killed my buck on that same exact stand location, uh, the field was beans. And when we were covering that deer, I had identified a really good scrape line. And the reference point we're using, there's a big dark scrape right behind us, and we saw it was like three yards this way. Sure enough, I can see blood. Yeah, I right. see his body right there. He's dead right there, dude. And when I went back into the summer of 2019 to that same exact field and saw that I was playing in the beans, it made me really excited thinking that we might be able to have a very similar encounter and maybe even the kill in late October. Max and I scouted there a couple of different times. We sat the field, never saw a mature buck, but it didn't discourage us from knowing that there more than likely was a mature buck using that bean field. It's just too big of a timber and that those beans are too secluded to not have something in there. So fast forward to October 3rd, you know, we had that cold front and most of the time, even though we had the cold front, guys aren't gonna dive into their better spots. You know, this was uh, one of those scenarios where I thought we were being really aggressive, public land, had nothing to lose, and uh, went straight back to the spot that I'd killed in in 2018. In retrospect, knowing what I know now, you know, our whole plan was to get on a buck, hopefully going to work a scrape. We knew those beans were gonna be the drawing power, and we knew the cold front was gonna get them up in daylight, but the trouble with that spot is how do you get the deer into bow range? And like I said, in retrospect, even if all these things had happened and the buck stepped out, we knew we were still at a low odds to get a buck in bow range. I knew where the scrape was. I knew that that was probably where the deer was gonna go, and sure enough, he did. We probably should have just dove right in knowing that we had nothing to lose, got in the tree right above that scrape. The reality is though, we decided to hang on the edge of that bean field. We encountered the buck and it gave us a lot of information. You know, we learned where he came out, uh, we put up a camera, got him on there multiple times, and we ended up making a move on him that next week. We had another big cold front come through, encountered him a second time, very similar to what you're gonna see with Louie's hunt, but unfortunately just never got a shot at the deer. And actually that second encounter was our final encounter. The pressure on that spot just lit up and we ended up deciding to move to a different piece altogether. But it was a really fun couple of hunts and we learned a lot. You know, just like I said, I think that looking back on it, if I was put in that exact same situation, knowing what I know about that spot, where those scrapes are, and you know, typically where those deer are popping into the field, I would have went right over that scrape day one. And uh, we might have had a shot at that buck. So it was just another good example of taking advantage of an early season feeding pattern, you know, low pressure at that point and uh, cold front. So. We're gonna jump into Louie's story. Uh, it was a really cool hunt, you know, and that's one of my favorite parts about what I get to do as a video editor 
you know, not only am I putting together these hunts, but I'm getting to learn from every single person that sends in their footage. And his just ended differently. He got a shot at this great deer, and uh, we're gonna waste no more time and jump right into that hunt. Well, it's the evening of October 6th here in Southern Iowa. Louie and I just got set up. It's about 5.30. Should be a pretty good evening, we're hoping. We got a, a storm coming in right now. Should be raining about 8.30, we think. Hopefully it gets the deer up on our, their feet and come out here and feed in these greens we got in front of us, standing beans. They've been hitting them a lot here recently, we've noticed. Uh, I think the main reason why they're, they're coming here so early is because it's in between two oak ridges. And they mosey out and they feed the beans for a little while and they work their way into the timber and eat on the acorns. With the storm rolling in, we got a front coming tomorrow. Highs of 61, and Louie will definitely be in the stand tomorrow. We'll just have to wait and see what comes out. So it's done right there, folks. And I'm about 99% sure he went down. We watched him go down. Whew, yeah, baby. It's been a long, long time coming. And that is a giant. Whew. So we come in here October 1st. Uh, we had pictures of this deer all, all summer on this soybean field. Um, we couldn't seal the deal that night. You come out into the middle of the field and it got too dark too fast and just couldn't get it done. So I decided the next day I would come in and put up a stand at noon and we would hunt it that night. Well, that plan worked except for he stayed out of range. He was about 86, 87 yards the whole time and we just couldn't, couldn't get him in. So we come in here the following night and we hunted for him again, but we never seen him. Uh, we seen another one of our hit list bucks, we call him Slingshot. And I decided I elected to pass him that night because I had my heart set on this deer and um, this is the only deer I wanted. So I was busy for a couple days and then we come back in here again tonight um, knowing that this front was coming in. So we knew he was going to be feeding hard. Um, he come in in this little cove out in front of us, fed out to about 86 yards, um, kind of went away for for a little bit and then a couple other, he followed a couple other bucks right into the stand, um, gave me a shot and I put it right in, right in the wheelhouse. It was interesting to watch these two early season hunts because over the years, we have so little success in early to mid October that it's just amazing because everybody's excited about going. So we have all of our teams in the field but I can't remember more than a half a dozen hunts uh, over the past 10 years that we've had good success on mature bucks in early October. And people talk about the October lull doesn't exist and, and all of those factors, but uh, I really believe it's a super tough time to kill a mature buck. Now, it doesn't mean it's not worth a try when you get those cold fronts coming through, but uh, you know we just have not had historically very much success there. It always picks up for us around the 25th or so of October. You catch a cold front during that last week of October, and it seems to be magical. Up until then, it's pretty hit or miss. But it was fun to see that buck that Louie shot. I mean, what a great deer. And, you know, unfortunately, it just didn't click for Josh. I mean, that was an excellent deer that he was after too, but uh, sometimes the, the situation, you know, like in his case, you know, hunting on the, on the pressured public land, and he maybe wasn't quite aggressive enough. Uh, either way, I mean, hindsight's always 20-20, but uh, it just reiterates to me 
what we've learned so many times over the years, if you're gonna have any action in October, it's gonna be on a cold front near food, but don't set your sights too heavily on the early part of October. In this next segment, I wanna talk about the Kubota UTVs. Kubota sent me two of them to uh, test and to use here on the farm. A gasoline model, which I've been using some, running around doing some chores. And then this is the diesel model. And this is a, I think it's 1100 cc's. And the cool part is that the diesel engine that's in here is actually the same one that they put in one of their small tractors. So the equivalent horsepower rating, uh, whatever that is, is the same one that they put in the utility tractors. So it's designed to do work. And it has uh, several different attachments, uh, accessories that you can add to it. This one has the spreader box on it. And today I'm gonna spread fertilizer on a number of my clover plots. I wish it was dry enough so we could actually work these and get the seed in the ground, but it's been wet enough this spring that uh, it's gonna have to be a few more days really of drying conditions before I can get the tiller in here and get this ready. But I can surely get the fertilizer down uh, and, and kind of show you along the way how the spreader works and uh, you know, some of the benefits of using a UTV for doing some of these small food plots rather than investing in a tractor. The fertilizer that I'm putting on here, since this is gonna be clover, is a mix that's heavy in P and K. So any fertilizer blend has three components, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. So you, you look at uh, fertilizer blends, and I don't wanna dive into too deeply what all those numbers mean and how you trace them back and figure out you know, how much of everything to put on because there's, there's definitely a lot of math there. But uh, the point being that I'm focusing on P and K on this one because the clover doesn't need nitrogen. And I went to the co-op and I, I had these tubs and they'll fill me up with uh, bulk fertilizer in these tubs. I've got one that I think it's called DAP, I think it is. It's, it's 18 N and 46 P and zero K. And the other one, the, the similar size as this is potash, and that's uh, 0, 0, 060. So when I get done, as long as I put roughly 100 pounds of this on this one acre food plot, you know, I'm gonna have uh, the, the equivalent of like 18, 46, 60 on here. So I don't need, because it's a highly concentrated fertilizer, I don't need a bunch of it. So I just need a few scoops, probably about 50 pounds or so of this one, then I'll drag the other tub up and get roughly 50 pounds of the other one. And when I spread this, you know, it should all mix together and get a nice clean, you know, like I said, 100 pounds of, of uh, 1846, 60. And I, I wish there was, you know, zero, eight, you know, zero nitrogen because I don't need it, uh, but we'll probably put a little bit of, of oats in here with this so that nitrogen would feed that oats so it's not wasted. Uh, but that's, uh, it's hard to get a blend. It's hard to get a blend that's exactly what you want because on the bulk fertilizer side, uh, there isn't anything out there that I know of that's perfect for feeding clover. You have to blend it. The best way to figure out the fertilizer blends is really just to talk to somebody that's you know, at a farmer's co-op and let them help you through it. Uh, otherwise, you can always just put a bunch of triple 13 or triple 19 down and get there too, but it just is more expensive and uh, you, you don't really need all that nitrogen when you're uh, putting fertilizer onto clover. Talk about the spreader just a little bit now. This is the first time I'm gonna use this, so I don't have it calibrated. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how much I actually put out on this little small plot, but there's, there's really three settings. One is how fast you drive, how fast the auger pulls the fertilizer in, and how fast the, the uh, spreader wheel turns. So you gotta get those three synced up so that you're spreading it over a certain area with a certain amount. You know, your speed and the auger speed will determine how much of it comes out. Then how fast you run the spreader will determine how big that area is. So I might not get this perfect, but little by little over the course of the next couple of acres that I do, I'll get those three things dialed in so that I'm putting out roughly, you know, the amount that I need to. Like I said, I want this thing empty by the time I get done here. So I'm just gonna make one pass down and uh, be kind of conservative on, on how I do my settings and to see where I'm at at that point. But it's really, it's really nice to have something like this because in the past I've tried to spread using the ATV spreaders and those things can handle about 80 or 90 pounds max. This thing can handle several hundred pounds, but it'll handle enough to do probably five or six acres. And uh, you know, the fertilizers, you know, or the spreaders on the, on the ATVs, you know, you could maybe do a half an acre at a time and then you gotta refill it and go again. So in theory, at least you could fill up at the house, put all your fertilizer in, go out to the field, spread it all and come back and not have to do what we're doing here where you're you know, hauling it with you everywhere you go. Uh, so let me, get this, uh, let me get this out and see where I end up.
I learned a couple of things in uh, spreading this first field. It was easier to calibrate this than I thought. Uh, I figured it'd be, you know, sort of like rain and fertilizer everywhere, but it works out pretty smooth. Inside there, you've got a control box. You can flip the whole power uh, on and off to the unit back here, and you can also adjust the auger rate and the spinner rate. So it didn't take me very long at all after the first pass to get a feel for you know how fast I had to run the auger and how fast I had to run the sprinter or the spinner to cover this whole area. So I think this system is really perfect for somebody who's got a, a number of smaller food plots and even bigger ones really. I mean, you can put enough in here to do several acres at a time. Uh, they also have the sprayer unit, which I'm gonna test here in the next few weeks as things start to get a little bit you know, drier and closer to the time when I'm gonna actually plant. So I'll show you that at that time. Uh, I think if I was a commercial food plot, uh, you know, land manager or in that profession, this would be awesome. Uh, something like this is, is ideal because then you don't have to haul tractors everywhere you go if you wanna work on a piece of ground. And if you own land with a lot of small food plots, this is way handier too than trying to you know, run all over the place with tractors. You can fill it up, go off to where you're going, spread it, and then uh, you know, be done. Plus you get the benefit of having a UTV uh, for all the other practical work that you have to do on the, on the property and for hauling game in and out and tree stands and uh, stuff like that. Uh, so I'll keep testing this and I'll keep giving you updates on what I learned, but my first take was it's not very hard to run. Uh, it's pretty simple to get that calibration dialed in and uh, got a lot of fertilizer on the ground here. So if we can get things to dry out, we're gonna get some clover growing here pretty soon. In this next segment, we're gonna join Pro Staff member Ben Hampton as he talks about one of his favorite venison recipes. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. Today we're making venison stroganoff. You will need two pounds of venison, a bag of egg noodles, chopped mushrooms, a whole chopped onion, two tablespoons of butter, a can of cream and mushroom soup, some sour cream, beef broth, and to taste, salt and pepper. Are they ready, bud? Yeah, they're ready. Okay, now we've got our two pounds of venison in our dredger. Now under here we have, and I forgot to include this in the ingredients in the beginning, we have our uh, about two cups of seasoned flour. A little blood's went through on it, that won't hurt anything. Okay, we're gonna give this just a little coating with some uh, just regular seasoned salt, whatever, whatever particular flavor you like the best. Spice counter. And then we're gonna give it some cracked black pepper. I like to season a little bit on the flour, a little bit on the meat. Now it's ready just to give a quick shake. Flip it over, shake it good. using the same pan that we cooked our meat in. We still have some cracklings from the meat that's gonna add a lot of flavor to this sauce. Now we're gonna add our garlic and pepper because our onions and mushrooms have cooked down. The reason why we add our garlic last is because it cooks faster and it gets bitter when it burns. We're gonna add in a cup of beef broth can of cream mushroom soup. Get it all in there good. And our onion mushroom mix. We're gonna pour in our meat now. Careful, don't let it slop. Now our meat's in, now we're gonna bring it to a simmer. So have some green beans simmering to go with our beef venison stroganoff. Now we're going to add in two cups of sour cream and reduce the heat and we're almost ready. That's it for this week. Uh, we're going to be back in the field, you know, again, weather permitting, we've got a lot of work to do yet, but uh, we'll keep working on these throwback hunts and, and uh, it's fun to be able to bring more detail to those hunts during the off season because during the season there's so much going on sometimes all we're able to do is show you the hunts 
and now we can break them down a little bit more. Uh, so we'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.